Okay, so as we've been saying, today is the last uh, one in our um, in our current series, though we're actually um, thinking of some other things that would be good to do. Um, and it's one that I want to finish on a positive note with peace building, though we will actually also be looking at sort of conflict as well. Um, I'm very pleased that we've got with us uh, Ellie Harrowell from University of Coventry, and I hope that also later we're going to have Mahona Chakraverti, because they are the authors, in fact, well, uh, Ellie is an author and uh, Mahona was a researcher for the peace building book, which um, I put um, in the reading for this class. And so uh, we can ask them, and Ellie in particular has done peace building in many different situations around the world. And so um, not just heritage, she actually is a peace studies person and heritage is just one of the many things she does. So it's a nice kind of um, segue uh, into looking at how also, you know, we can work with other professionals uh, in this field. So. Um, now, seeing heritage as part of peace building actually is might at first glance seem to be a bit um, of a difficult argument to make, to be honest, because we much more often see it as a source of conflict. In fact, almost universally on our screens, we see it as something that is being blown up or destroyed or fought over. We don't really see it as something that like brings people together necessarily, but um, I'm hoping we're gonna be able to turn that around a bit. Um, but um, perhaps we're, we're more familiar with the way that it's become weaponized as an instrument of war, and most particularly in recent uh, wars. And I'm going to go in a minute into why exactly that is. So here are some examples. In retaliation, the Croats targeted the Mostar Bridge, which Muslims had built 400 years earlier. It was four years to the day since the Berlin Wall had come down, ushering in the new world order. Cameramen were granted rare access into the Antiquities Museum in Mosul, Iraq, after forces retook the building from Islamic State on Tuesday. Hundreds of rare books and manuscripts had been reduced to ash, the Associated Press reported. Iraqi archaeologists confirmed that some of the artifacts destroyed were original ancient stone statues dating back thousands of years. Some Iraqi officials and experts had previously claimed that the statues were replicas. Mosul's Antiquities Museum once housed priceless Mesopotamian artifacts dating back thousands of years and a collection of rare Islamic and pre-Islamic texts. In 2015, the Islamic State group released a video showing militants using sledgehammers to smash the ancient artifacts, describing them as idols that must be removed. The reclaiming of the museum comes as Iraqi troops continue to liberate Mosul from Islamic State. On Tuesday, troops seized major landmarks in western Mosul, including the main government complex that Islamic State had used as a command center. Iraqi military commanders said the seizure signaled that the militant group's sturdiest lines of defense in the city are crumbling. So there we saw uh, Mostar Bridge in um, 1993. Uh, the Bamiyan Buddhas and the destruction of the Mosul Museum.
But it's not only in war situations that heritage is weaponized. It's also increasingly so in civil society, where it's become central to disputes concerning identity and also concerning the historical record. And by that, I mean the how history has been taught to us, how we perceive history. Um, sometimes archaeologists and heritage people call this the authorized heritage discourse. And what they mean by that is that a certain narrative is put on events and then um, monuments are put up to sort of to 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 reproduce the story in that way. And um, as time has gone on, there's been more and more conflict over this because views of history have changed. And we've touched on, in fact, in other presentations, um, issues of colonization and decolonization. And it's a very, very big issue. This is King Leopold of Belgium. Um, uh, and there's been a lot of um, a lot of dispute in Belgium over uh, his role in particular. Um, but of course, it goes right across the world. Um, this is in uh, America, in Richmond, Virginia, one of many, many monuments after the um, the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and demands really that this heritage is not just pulled down, but also it's the center for calls for restorative justice. That means for doing something to, to try and put things right, to try and put things right as regards the historical record and also perhaps some of the more tangible legacies of these periods. So, I think we have to ask ourselves why, what exactly has happened? Because uh, museums and heritage and monuments didn't used to be quite so controversial. Um, it used to be, you know, some a place that some people thought was kind of boring. It's kind of anything but boring these days. It's kind of, you feel you're at the middle of a maelstrom in this, what is happening? Why is it now? Well, we really have to go back to um, the events in the late 1980s and 1990s, and in particular, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union and its dissolution into separate states and the end of the Cold War. Because this did usher in a new era, an era where conflict was not really going to be divided down the fault lines that it had been previously of communism against capitalism. Uh, those were two really sort of monolithic positions in which there was no gradation one into the other. Um, and everybody lined up in two camps. And uh, historians and sociologists certainly saw the 1990s as a time when things really changed. And they changed in to focus more on social issues within our societies. Uh, and we have a number of uh, books that became quite uh, sort of iconic. Uh, this one called The Culture Wars by James Davison Hunter was published in 1991. I wonder if he still likes that title. I wonder if he rather regrets it now, considering what it's used for. But that essentially put forward the thesis, which I guess has been borne out to a very large degree, that um, political and social change now is a battle for the control of culture. He was talking just about America, but I think we see this now in other countries throughout the world where there becomes a sort of fracturing between two groups, one group being orthodox conservative and another group being progressive liberal and they have become increasingly polarized. Um, 
this became a very famous book. Uh, Francis Fukuyama published a book called The End of History. And what he meant by that was that with the fall of communism and supposedly the victory of Western liberal democracy, he felt there were now going to be no other ideological changes, that essentially the world was fixed, that we'd gone through all of our ideological battles, and that's what he called the end of history. In fact, he couldn't have been further from the truth, really, because uh, Western liberal democracy has um, definitely retreated from that high point in the 1990s. And the one that I suppose is most often um, quoted, which is Samuel Huntingdon's Clash of Civilizations and the remaking of the world order. It tends to be quoted by politicians, in which he claims the fundamental source of conflict is not going to be ideological or even economic, but the great divisions will be cultural and that this is what will cause the, um, the divisions and the conflict in the future. Of course, none of these writers at the time uh, could predict the impact of the internet, which I guess has really changed a lot of things or maybe just intensified the debate. But certainly we're in a very different position now from in the Cold War. In the Cold War, um, by and large, you conflicts um, and uh, wars were really very much lined up, lined up along country lines, along the lines of um, nations. Um, and that has been something that has not been so common after the end of the Cold War. Um, in fact, really, this current conflict between Russia and Ukraine is one of the first times since that, uh, since uh, the 20th century, that we've had these nation states in what's called peer-to-peer -peer combat. Most of the conflict in between those times has been um, what we call non-state actors. Uh, people who are acting outside of the um, national organizations. And that's one of the reasons why um, heritage has become such a symbol, because it's a symbol of identity. Um, in the 20th century, after the Second World War, um, in 1954, there was passed the Hague Convention, which sought to limit um, damage to cultural heritage in times of war. And um, that in one sense was kind of possible to do because uh, war was controlled by the countries, by the nations and nations sign up to international laws. But of course, when you've got non-state actors, well, they've got no interest in following international laws. In fact, it's in their interest often to do the exact opposite of that. And so we end up with these um, cultural symbols becoming targets in themselves. And that's very much what we see now on many levels, on levels of war, out and out war, but also on levels of civil disturbance as well. Um, I thought this was an interesting um, piece of research which is done by, um, I just need to move, see if I can move our, um, so I can see the, okay. So um, this is in fact, a um, some research that's done, King's College London, and it's looking at newspaper articles in um, Britain. And it's looked at how they've gone throughout the years. They've got more and more focused on, um, social issues and on issues to do with um, with kind of liberal ideas or to do with social trends. So for example, the first one, the first number one, which goes up to 2008, the emphasis is on political culture and identity. 
Um, and then between 2008 and 2015, there's growing coverage of morally charged issues, particularly around abortion, gay marriage, racism. Then because this is Britain, there's a period uh, between about 2016 and 2018 in which there's um, intensified interest in political identity because of Brexit. But then since then, you can see there's a mass of articles related to all kinds of issues, such as COVID face masks, Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion protests, things that are actually social issues rather than political ideological issues. Um, and that's where protest tends to come these days. So we can say that heritage is predisposed to be conflictual at the moment. It wasn't before, but it is now. But can we turn it around and make it a vehicle for peace? Is it possible for us to take these symbols which are in themselves um, sources of conflict and can we make them into something which brings about peace? Well, we need to go back a bit, first of all, and have a look at what didn't work out so well in trying to build peace in order to understand exactly what went wrong. And I want to go back to the uh, Balkan Wars in the 1990s. Um, and we saw in the clips at the beginning, we saw um, the Mostar Bridge uh, being blown up which became a very firm symbol of the war. Um, and it introduced most of us to the term ethnic cleansing, which was not something that was much spoken about before, though it had in essence been carried out before. Ethnic cleansing was essentially the, it involved the transfer of people, but also the destruction of heritage along ethnic lines. And the intention of it is to turn a multicultural landscape into a monocultural landscape, to actually divide people according to their ethnicities and to either remove or allow to decay traces of other uh, ethnicities. Um, and the Mostar Bridge, which we saw in the clip, was uh, one of the great um, symbols of this. Um, so Mostar, before the wars, was uh, a prosperous place. It was a very pretty place, multicultural, strong tourism, uh, with almost equal proportions of Croats, Muslims and Serbs. And although there were certain parts of the city that were given over to certain types of religious monuments. In general, minorities lived in majority areas without problems. People married outside their ethnic group. But all of this came to a very um, abrupt change in 1992. Uh, and Mostar became the most heavily bombed area of the Balkans. And by the end of the war, it was in uh, ruins. And of course, the biggest, um, well, the most prominent um, casualty of this was the Ottoman bridge in Mostar, because that bridge was uh, built in the 16th century. It was built by a famous Ottoman architect. And it was not only practical, it was also symbolic. It was seen as joining the different religious sectors of the town. And so to destroy it was a, a very conscious act. And indeed, we can tell it was a very conscious act because we saw the video clip at the beginning and um, it was pre-announced pre to make sure that it would get, in fact, onto, um, onto the media. So it was, it was intended to be a symbolic act. And... After the war ended, the rebuilding of this bridge became uh, a key part of the peace building program in Mostar. 
Uh, this is a temporary bridge that they put up, but they wanted to get to work immediately to rebuild this bridge because it was felt that it would be a symbol to the world of the fact that the war is over and, you know, everybody's back together again sort of thing. And it was a big international project. There really was so much money given to this uh, from UNESCO, the World Bank, the Aga Khan Organization, World Monuments Fund, the Council of Europe, different governments. Uh, they all contributed to the rebuilding of this bridge. And it was actually rebuilt in a very short period of time, uh, just three or four years. Um, it cost $15.5 million, which in the 1990s was a very considerable sum of money. But almost all of the work and all of the money was spent really on foreign NGOs and experts. Uh, very little money reached local people. Um, and in fact, the Balkans became a bit of a by word for a sort of NGO explosion during the 1990s. So many NGOs were created and went to the Balkans and they really went in and did not interact with local people or really provide any meaningful employment um, for them. A lot of people became rather skeptical uh, about them and rather cynical um, about them. And this bridge was done very quickly, the huge amount of money. And so from the sort of perspective of the donor organizations, it was a success. It was a big success. And um, in other presentations, uh, we've sort of questioned this definition of success. Um, like, for example, with the Aswan Dam in Egypt, whether you can really sort of say something successful on the basis of the monuments alone without actually factoring in the people. Because the town of Mostar, not very much money was given to it at all. Um, and in fact, uh, even today, um, there is still money given to tourist areas and the tourism industry has to a certain extent uh, recovered, but there's a distinct lack of investment everywhere else. Um, and worse than that, there's also a completely divided uh, society. Um, instead of coming together as this bridge was telling everybody had happened, in fact, um, the ethnic divisions have never been more uh, strongly enforced, and it's certainly not gone back to the city it was uh, before, where people uh, lived um, without, they lived in other communities without fear. So this, for example, is a school, and it's typical of um, the areas, the schools are divided, you go to one or you go to the other, but you don't mix. This is um, quite, and an, I'm interested to hear Ellie's uh, ideas on this at the end, because this is a common tactic of power sharing and so-called peace building is to like divide societies, but there's a very real fear that this is just building up problems for the future. Uh, very sadly, uh, one of the most uh, beautiful places in Mostar, the Partisan Memorial Cemetery, um, which is on the National Register, was in fact just the other day, I think it was yesterday, um, it was put on Europa Nostra's um, Heritage in Danger list, which they published. Um, you may have seen it on LinkedIn. Um, and it has been vandalized and, um, you know, it's not in a good state at all. And clearly it's a very uh, beautiful monument. Um, it was also the case that uh, until um, December of 2020, um, <clears throat> since 2008, 
there were no local elections there. So um, it was said to be too uh, chaotic a place to hold elections. And in the end, it was only by taking a case to the European Court of Human Rights that elections were held for local government. And so um, I don't know if the situation's improved since then. Um, perhaps uh, local people from that area, if they're on this uh, call, they can tell us in the chat if things have improved since elections uh, have been held. But, um, you know, the building of the bridge did not really help any of this. It helped international organizations. It helped a lot, the foreigners who went to work there. But I think you've got to question whether the huge sums of money that were piled into it really helped the people. And this is what this short video clip is about. <laughs> It is, it's still divided. We have this side and we have that side. There is still definitely a lot more to be done, as I already mentioned, especially with older generations who are still in that like mindset uh, that uh, they had during the war. In kindergarten, uh, you have to choose whether to send your child to Bosniak or, or a Croat kindergarten. Uh, and children don't meet during education at all. They grow up apart. My, my biggest fear is that by separate educational system, we are building foundations for the next conflict. So I think we have to ask ourselves the question, would it have been better to have taken longer over the bridge and worked through the local communities? Um, the issue with doing that is that it's a kind of, you know, it's going to be a messy procedure. Um, it's not going to be quick. It's going to be difficult. But ultimately, does it get you better results? And could donors have been persuaded to buy into such a model? I mean, that's really always the difficulty. And that was mentioned both by uh, Rohit in the presentation on disasters and also by Peter Gould in our last presentation on development. Um, you know, it's hard to get them to agree to it because working through the community can be very uh, difficult, but, you know, ultimately, you could get a better result doing that. So, as I mentioned before, it's not just in war situations that you get these conflict, these conflicts. And uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, with Black Lives Matter protest, there have been global conflicts conversations now over racial prejudice and over the legacy of slavery in contemporary uh, contemporary societies. And let's have a look at another um, instance where maybe the resolution was a little bit different, should we say. 
So that was quite, uh, it caused a lot of headlines at the time. And so the mayor of um, Bristol uh, commissioned a report on what to do. And they actually carried out a very broad survey uh, amongst the population of Bristol and found that 50% of the population of Bristol were very positive about the fact the statue had been pulled down and 15% were positive. So 65% were pleased that that had happened. And younger people felt even more strongly that uh, the statue should have been uh, pulled down. But of course, what to do next? Um, they did fish the statue um, out of the river, uh, but what were they going to do with it? I have to say, I, 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 as an archaeologist, I found it uh, sort of quite interesting to see what was um, standard practice in Roman times. In Roman times, when someone fell out of favour, that was exactly what the Romans did. They pulled down all the statues and threw the statues in the Tiber. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see it happening again. Every time they dredged the Tiber, um, they always come up with lots of statue bits uh, of Roman statues that were thrown there. Um, now, interestingly, people did not want to get rid of the statue. 80% wanted it to be put on display in a museum. Um, and 
one part that I found very interesting was 80% wanted the statue to be displayed horizontally, which of course is interesting because it does take away the power aspect of having the statue supine and they wanted all the graffiti to be conserved on it. That's actually proved quite a headache in fact for the conservators uh, to keep the graffiti on it. 71% wanted to have a plaque at the plinth to record the event, and they want 58% wanted the plinth to be used for temporary artworks. And so this one was designed of one of the activists on the day. And so she's got her statue up there now. And this was what the mayor said. Uh, the mayor is quite a progressive um, person. I think he's possibly the first black mayor of uh, Bristol. I may be wrong in that, but I seem to recall hearing that. And he points out how people feel they're losing control of their city and their world. And um, it means that you have to, when you've got to change, you've got to take people with you. And he wanted to, to have a new kind of representation of Bristol's history, uh, how we've become the city we are. We were heroes, um, whether they're women, trade union organizers, abolitionists, black people, Asian people, gay people, they're essentially all part of Bristol. So I guess the lesson we need to take away from this in using heritage in peace building, it's how you do it is as important as what you do. It's, it's about the process of doing it, not just the end result. And one of the problems I think that we have, as we've discussed before in other situations, is that often uh, all of the emphasis is on the end result, not on the process of doing it. So how can reconstruction help the healing uh, process? How is it that after conflict, you can reconstruct something and it actually assists you? Well, we have some good examples um, historically that show us different ways of doing this. So here is the city of Warsaw, a very beautiful city, which suffered uh, a very horrible fate in the Second World War. It was completely destroyed. Um, the city was left in absolute ruins. And at first, whoops, at first it was thought that the ruins were so complete that the city should be left as a memorial and rebuilt elsewhere. But the people didn't want to do that and they took matters into their own hand. And um, an exhibition on the city said, you know, this is our city and it's a living symbol without which a nation cannot exist. And uh, ordinary people came together to get the bricks from the rubble and to start rebuilding the center of the city. And this is what it looks like today. So this may look like it's uh, medieval, but it was actually built in the 1950s to reconstruct. Uh, and undoubtedly this for the people of Warsaw, this was their decision. And I don't think they regret it in any way. In fact, they're extraordinarily proud of it of the fact that it shows that they were not crushed in any way. Uh, they had a beautiful city, it was destroyed and they rebuilt it. It's quite a symbol. Um, it was very interesting when they came up for, uh, they wanted UNESCO World Heritage status, um, which at the time caused um, a bit of a problem because at the time uh, reconstruction was not normally permitted for World Heritage listing because it wasn't considered to be authentic. Uh, but this was such an extraordinary situation that the idea of turning it down was really not acceptable. And um, the regulations were modified to include reconstruction, which was done on the basis of 
uh, plans that accurate plans. So um, it was a real achievement. Full reconstruction is not always what everybody goes for, but there are other ways. So this is Berlin, this is the Reichstag. Um, and what was decided uh, to in the rebuilding of uh, Berlin was not to rebuild everything as it had been exactly, but to preserve the memory by incorporating new new aspects. So this is the dome of the Reichstag, and it obviously makes reference to the previous shape, but it's certainly not a reconstruction. It's, uh, it's a piece of modernist architecture. And the idea is that it's transparency is allowing you, because if you go up there, you can look down on the meetings um, of the parliament. And so the transparency is a kind of metaphor for the new state. And um, again, a kind of uh, what I'm assuming is a deliberate decision to not repair uh, all of the bullet marking markings that there are, but to leave them as evidence. Oops. And of course, also having memorials uh, to those who've died, that can be a very important aspect as well. A place to go for healing, a place that um, uh, becomes an acknowledgement of those uh, who died. And this was to children in the siege of uh, Sarajevo. And I think our recent memorials have tended to, if we look back to the period in the 20th century, when there were memorials of big wars, often those memorials are trying to kind of glorify the war, whereas we now, in our modern memorials, like this one, and like, for example, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, we often look to instead just remember the individuals to give them um, a place in history with their name. So I want now to introduce our two guests who are going to um, give us some real first-hand experience uh, of peace building. And I'm just going to very briefly um, go through the work that uh, they did in their peace building um, assessment tool for heritage recovery, um, which you should, which you can all download. Um, it's it's on the ICROM um, uh, website. But just, I thought I would just, in order to help us lead into the discussion, I would just take out an example from the book that they did. Uh, and their four stage path, which consists of, first of all, understanding the context of the conflict, understanding the heritage that's there, mapping the stakeholders, and then before coming up with a real peace building plan. So uh, I just took out one example that they had, which was Homs in Syria, and the project focused on um, the rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of the historic houses, a lot of which have been left uh, unused as their owners uh, have left the country. And they wanted to have a set of strategies for disputes to assist displaced communities, recovery plans, particularly as regards poverty, through using these buildings, involving the local communities in the appropriate strategies, and strengthening trust between different stakeholders. And this involved mapping all the stakeholders, and then understanding the level of risk, which was very high in this case, before coming up with strategies for risk mitigation and peace building. So there would be physical restoration of the houses, 
adaptive reuse and memorialization with the aim of uh, healing trauma. The use of intangible cultural heritage at several points during um, these presentations, we've spoken a lot about how intangible cultural heritage is so important, particularly in building um, cultural resilience and in getting people back to a normal lifestyle. And then getting an active participation between local communities and the government. Um, Peter, in, in our last presentation, spoke about how difficult that is, that relationship between local communities and the government. But uh, now I'm going to stop there, come out of stop share, and um, uh, I'm going to welcome, first of all, um, Ellie, Ellie Harrowell, who is uh, one of the authors of the book. And she's at University of Coventry Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. And uh, the other, um, our other guest is Mahona, Mahona Chakrabarti, and uh, we'll be going to her as well. But uh, Ellie, I'd like to go over to you to um, talk about what is your... Um, impression of peace building using heritage because you've been a peace studies person in many different situations what do you think are the plus and the minus points of doing peace building using um, local heritage thanks Valerie uh, and thanks for inviting me and it was a, a really interesting presentation um, so I delay my cards on the table. I would say I am a big believer in the potential of heritage to support peace building and both kind of peace building with a capital B in these big situations of, um, of overt violence and also kind of a small P in the sense of how do we live together peacefully um, in our local communities. So I think there's a huge amount of potential there for a number of reasons, but I'm not sure we're doing it right yet uh, and also for a number of reasons. So I think one of the really important things you highlighted um, today is this importance of um, engaging local communities from the very beginning. Some of the big mistakes in kind of the earlier years of peace building in the way we see it now, so the kind of the post-Cold War era of peace building, was this uh, externally driven, you know, outsider experts, one size fits all, we we're going to come in and fix this for you. And in more recent years, there has been um, an understanding in the in the kind of global peace community uh, that that doesn't work you know it's there is no way of doing a one-size-fits-all uh, model every context is different and you can't successfully start to build back relationships uh, between different groups and between different people without having those people along you know, for the ride with you and so there's, there's been a local turn um, as we'd kind of call it more widely in theory at least because in reality in practice it's quite difficult to um to implement and to get these kind of large institutions to really commit to handing power over to, to local people and um, that that is a challenge but i think that heritage is very well um situated to help that because what is heritage if not something that is meaningful to people you know in their everyday lives and their everyday uh, communities so if we use heritage and we take a heritage kind of uh, inspired approach to building peace then we are already committing ourselves to this, the contextual specificity of what we're working with. Um, it helps us to put, to listen more, I would say, um, to local people, to local communities and, and what they think. So there's a, a huge uh, potential there. It also helps us to understand the process of peace building more broadly, because another lesson we've learned in the last 20 years is that you can't build peace in silos. It's not just an economic issue. It's not just a political issue, it's not just a social issue. You have to think broadly about the kind of interlinking systems in a conflict affected community. And I think that's why we've seen, particularly in recent years, more and more types of organizations start to talk about peace and start to talk about their responsibilities with regards to peace. I think the heritage sector is very much a good example of that. You know, recent years, um, the work that ICROM, uh, that Mahona has been doing is, is a really good example of that, of um, an organization from a non-traditional kind of uh, organization for working on peace has really started engaging um, with this. And I think that's that's very positive um, in the way we do that. 
Unfortunately, and I saw I saw someone mention it in the comments. Actually, uh, uh, one of the, the things that I think holds us back a bit is we tend both within the peace building sector and with the heritage sector to think in quite projectized terms, and that affects the way that we do work. So it makes it more difficult to actually work meaningfully with local communities because we're used to working in this kind of project way where you swoop in with your expert, you work to certain timetables, and you kind of leave again. That's not good for peace building. Peace is made and sustained and remade over hugely long time frames. I mean, it, it's a process, not an end goal. Um, and so we, we have this, this kind of projectized um, issue uh, that, that we struggle to get over. Um, and I also think, and this is kind of the direction that my own research personally is going. We, I mean, you rightly pointed out, Valerie, that one of the issues has been the kind of divisions that are introduced by conflict and then can be sustained or even reified by our responses to conflict. You know, we, we divide people, we put up um, walls, for example, to keep warring parties apart and that actually sustains divisions. Quite often the very well-meaning heritage-based um, response to that is to try and use heritage to find a shared narrative, to use yeah. you know, to find an emblematic uh, heritage site or practice that can provide us with a shared narrative to reconstitute communities around. I'm not sure that's ever going to work because I think every time you try and narrate a new story or you try and kind of come up with a one a one unifying narrative, you're always silencing some voices. So yeah. for me, I think the real potential and 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 these examples of um of the monuments, the debates around monuments, are a very good example of this. The real potential of of heritage is how can we use it as a space where multiple narratives can be heard? We talk about this as um, as agonistic dialogue. So this process of being listened to and listening yourself and not necessarily having to agree, but that yeah. process actually allowing for a more meaningful and sustained um, process of building peaceful communities. And I, I, I sincerely believe that there is a real um, possibility there for heritage to play a positive role. Um, but it's it's a question of how do we enable those processes um, that, that, that's the real big question. And how do you enable those processes when you're in a situation where everyone feels kind of very under pressure to get stuff done quickly? Because that's the other thing. In a post-conflict situation, everything is urgent and everything needs doing right now. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, Mahona, we keep mentioning you. <laughs> we, need to, uh, we need to ask you for, uh, if you're with us, uh, Yes. Uh, there you are. There you are. Uh, <laughs> good. So, uh, tell me, what do you think are the particular challenges of uh, peace building? You did a lot of the research for this book. Uh, by the way, I should tell you that uh, when you're answering in the chat, you need to change it to everyone, rather than otherwise it only okay. you're let me go to the hosts and panelists. So change it to everyone. Right. So. I just realized that. Okay. I yes, will keep that yes, in mind. Yes. yes. Uh, so, um, yes. Tell us what you see as the particular challenges. Right. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Uh, so I think uh, I will go back to the term that you mentioned in your presentation the authorized discourse of heritage. And uh, in the research, because we did a lot of research before we published PATH, and uh, as Ellie mentioned, it was, uh, I think PATH is a great success because ICROM, which is a cultural institution, uh, partnered up with Ellie, who is, you know, a peace building expert. And that's why the, uh, the tool is so integrated in, uh, in that way. Uh, and uh, so during this research, what we realized is, uh, um, not only in peace building, but also in other fields, you know, in disaster reduction or in climate action, we are perceiving heritage as a thing, as an object. Uh, and that's where, you know, our ideas of reconstruction, rehabilitation of a monument comes. And in conflict, uh, we often uh, find heritage to be a victim. You know, it's always when you go into uh, conflict studies or you see an example of a conflict heritage is often something that was destroyed that was the uh, you know as i said victim of the conflict but 
once we start looking heritage as a process, which is now, uh, you know, a debated topic uh, by Professor Laura Jane Smith, uh, who has done incredible work on this, uh, you know, when we start seeing heritage as the lived experiences of the people, uh, as the knowledge held by the people, as, uh, you know, the, the way the people have adapted to their environment, their relationship with the environment uh, and with the surroundings. Once we start perceiving heritage in that way, uh, I think our whole uh, approach changes and our interventions are more community-based. Uh, we are involving the communities in you know, tackling the challenges and this way there are less chances of you know, relapse uh, and you, know, you, you uh, enhance the potential of uh, sustainable peace. And if I can you know, give you an example from PATH itself, uh, we see in Timbuktu uh, in Mali, uh, we had a case study in path and what we saw is uh, so one of the feet one of the steps uh, in path the tool uh, is that we have to make a timeline of events uh, the conflict events uh, so what we realized is that the uh, war that took place in 2012 uh, by the extremist groups uh, they were composed of many young people in the groups who destroyed heritage who uh, you know, prohibited some cultural practices uh, in certain areas. And uh, then the next event, which was prominent, was uh, the international agencies. They put these monuments in the danger list. So, you know, again, perceiving heritage is something that is physical, that is an object, and you protect it. So uh, right after this happened, there were further attacks. So it did not solve much. Uh, and when now, if we go back in time, and again, in the timeline, we realized that in the 1960s, that's where the problem started. And I think, you know, uh, that's also something we talk about in path is to identify the root causes. So in 1960s, we see that this northern part of uh, Mali was extremely neglected. They were uh, discriminated against, and they had limited, you know, access to the central government, to facilities, and so on. So, the problem was not solved. We thought that maybe putting these monuments or heritage, which are being attacked in the danger list, might be help be helpful. Uh, but it was not helpful because it did relapse in the end and therefore if you are not you know looking into say the youth groups or you're not putting them in one place and understanding their requirements their needs uh making community consultations or making communities mediate negotiate uh, between themselves uh providing job opportunities pro you know enhancing or uh uh, yeah, their livelihood opportunities, uh, then, yeah, it, it will just lead to further relapse. Right, right, right. Um, Melissa, can I come to you? And are there um, things in the chat that uh, perhaps in particular uh, would be good for Ellie and Mahona to, to talk to? So far, there has only been one question that has come through. Um, and that is, is there any literature about the use of heritage for peace building that aren't in conflict zones? For example, Costa Rica hasn't had large scale conflict for the majority of its history. Nonetheless, here as everywhere, we need to work toward fostering a culture of peace. How can we use heritage in a more daily sense to maintain peace, not in a crisis situation? Yeah, that's quite a good one. I don't know, have uh, Ellie and Mahona, have you come across any examples of almost preventive, really, I guess? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Funnily enough, I'm writing a grant with, with that. That's uh, one of the oh, issues yeah. I'm raising at the moment. <laughs> uh, one, I mean, one good example of this, I think, um, uh, and this is kind of part of what I'm, I'm looking to, to write on, is um, the Cities of Culture initiatives. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I've been looking particularly in the UK at the way that City of Culture, um, as an idea, has been used to try and... Um, foster peaceful relationships within cities. So in the UK, the past four times we've done it, because that's as, as far as it's been as a national scheme, um, it's almost always been given to cities who are perceived to have 
uh, a problem with social cohesion, uh, intercommunal, intergroup um, tensions, and so on. So we've had uh, the first one was Derry, London Derry, which was um, obviously a city in Northern Ireland um, with legacy of intercommunal tension. Hull, um, then uh, Coventry, which is obviously where uh, my centre is based, and now the next one will be Bradford. All three uh, cities very much known for kind of post-industrial decline and um, and communal tensions either along uh, ethnic lines, uh, economic inequality, and so on. And so there's quite a lot of literature actually beginning to look at why, how can cultural heritage play a part in, in kind of creating and sustaining peace on that, um, on, on a civic level, on a city level, um, I think is a really interesting um, avenue to go on. It, it's an argument I try to make quite often that what we're talking about at this kind of international big picture level is just as applicable at a kind of a, 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 a local level. And actually the the, the two um, tools that we've written together, Mahona and I, so um, both PATH and then our, to plug our most recent publication, uh, the Community-Based <laughs> Heritage Indicators for Peace, downloadable now. Yes, um, I saw that, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the way we try to write them is to be usable actually at all of these levels, because that's very much the same, um, the same ideas are being played out. One of my favorite, one of uh, my, I think one of the most interesting um, examples of of kind of the ongoing, the long reach of both uh, conflict and heritage is in Bolzano in Italy. Um, okay. Some of the interventions that have been made with some of the fascist era memorials there and monuments are really, really interesting, showing both why, how it still matters, even in a place that has been, you know, you'd perceive as having been a peaceful place um, for, for quite some time now. Number one, there is still serious contestation about heritage that means something to people and that links to, to previous and ongoing conflicts. And number two, some really, really um, um, creative responses to it. So one of the, the, the monuments has a, every night now has a, a Hannah Arendt quote projected onto it as a way of kind of committing to this, uh, to demonstrating the tension and the disagreement around it. Um, in a kind of an interesting and um, and productive way. So yes, there's there is um, there is stuff going on, and um, and and I think there's it's a growing area as well. Um, quite often, if you are looking for for literature in particular um, at that level, quite often it might be termed um, as kind of social cohesion, um, right. and that because there's there's you find quite often people presume that peace is something that happens internationally and then um, community relations and social cohesion is something that happens at the yeah. national level. But actually, you know, really, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about how to live peacefully um, in, in a, a community. Yes, yes. Um, in the chat, Elisa was asked, what's the UK program called again? Oh, just City of Culture, because uh, there's, there's the long-standing European program of Cities of Culture, um, but I, I about 12 years ago now, I guess, um, the UK started its own. I mean, perhaps presciently knowing that we were going yeah, exactly. to <laughs> leave no, the, no, the main yeah. one. <laughs> right. I mean, I think one of the things that, um, um, you know, you can sort of correct me here, Ellie, if I'm wrong, that one of the things that um, we can learn, particularly from peace studies professionals, is that we should stop thinking of peace as being the sort of the norm and explaining war and conflict and we should start to take on board the fact that it actually is you know normal in inverted commas for human societies to be in conflict and um, in order to maintain peace and to have the best possible relations this is something we need to think about the whole time not just think about it when there's a war, we need to think about it the whole time. And as we are now increasingly, because of the world we live in, we're increasingly living together, different cultures, different ethnicities, different religions. We have to try and get along in a way that maybe previous generations didn't have to, they weren't so challenged in that way. And oh. so this is a constant thing really for us to be working at. I would, I would uh, take what you said and flip it slightly. And so I, I, my kind of um, philosophical frame that I use in my work is a conflict transformation, um, a, a conflict transformational lens. And what that says actually 
is there's nothing wrong with conflict. All yes. human life is conflict. Conflict is disagreement, fundamentally. Progress doesn't happen without disagreement, without someone saying, I think we could do this in a better way. Democracy is a system of, of kind of, um, of, of disagreement that we've just you know, worked out how to, to kind of institutionalize it somewhat. There's absolutely nothing wrong with conflict. It is a, a central element of human life. The problem is violent. Yes. The problem is violence and coercion. And so the yes. question is, how do we um, deal with conflict in a way that it can become a generative and productive force and not right. devolve into a, a situation of coercion and violence? And, and, and in this context, I guess the question is, what role can heritage play in that? You know, what is the heritage that we have and we share in our communities that can help us um, have those constructive discussions? And how do we manage conflict around heritage to make sure that it can be a productive generative process rather than devolving into uh, violence or coercion or, or a process in which people feel silenced and feel that they're not being heard, and their, their voices aren't being valued. Um, I think to me that's that's really the, the crux of the matter. We'll, there will always be conflict in human society um, over, over one issue or another, um, but it's yes. a question of how do we embrace that and how do we institutionalize even ways of dealing with that, um, that conflict uh, proactively and productively. I think that the, the quote that you put up from um, the mayor of Bristol is quite is, is useful in that. And I know I've, I've been speaking to another colleague at a university in Bristol about some of the work they've been doing there with them, um, the civic engagement and uh, the city university in terms of trying to create systems and structures that allow people to come together and disagree proactively yeah. and, and, and constructively. Constructively. Uh, there's a question here, which I'll put to you, but I think you might want to sidestep it. It says, <laughs> I think, Barbara, I'm going to sidestep it. Uh, very interested to hear about examples like Tibet and Jerusalem. <laughs> in, in, what, in, in what respect? I mean, we, I've, I've been working on a, um, a, a heritage-based uh, project in uh, the Occupied Palestinian Territory for quite some time. Oh, have you? Um, yes. Yes, uh, which I think is a good example of how... Um, uh, uh, some of the interesting ways that heritage can support peace. So we've worked, we've been doing an oral history project with young people in Masafayata, um, which is a very, very rural community in Area C. Um, actually, recently there was a large, uh, the final kind of after a 20 year uh, law, um, lawsuit, they, uh, it was been declared a live firing zone uh, for the Israeli military. And we've been working with 19 communities there to train young people in recording their intangible cultural heritage, um, partially because it is under direct um, threat of the impacts of, of, of the Arab-Israeli conflict, because if people have to leave eventually, then that intangible heritage will, will likely be lost. But what we have found is that it's been really um, a really constructive process in terms of helping those young people to find ways of speaking constructively and advocating for their communities peacefully. Um, because I think in situations of conflict, you find your choices often get reduced. Um, yes. You find your, 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 the kind of suite of choices you can make becomes radically reduced from what you might have in a more peaceful situation. Um, and quite often for these young people, um, the way they could speak about their, their communities was very reduced. It was simply around um, very oppositional terms and uh, very um, uh, around kind of survival, basically. And through this um, engagement with the elder community members and this engagement with their history and really becoming um, masters of their own heritage, they could speak about their communities in a really positive way. They could advocate for their communities in a whole new way, which was very positive, very grounded in um, in kind of peaceful proactive activism. And I think that's you know, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to agree about you know who has the right to be where and who has the right to to to, um, to take ownership of heritage in that area and in that region. But it puts people on a slightly more equal footing in terms of how they speak about it um, and the range of options they have to advocate for their communities. Um, and if I may add something to this, uh, Ellie, 
because you talked about this, uh, the youth uh, in Palestine and how, you know, they have been uh, in touch with their elders. We have a very uh, solid example, which we, we actually worked with this uh, group of researchers from Palestine uh, about the olive garden and uh, gardening in Palestine. So <clears throat> basically now, uh, you know, the youth, they are... Uh, going back to their ancestors, they're going back to their grandparents uh, and trying to learn about this olive gardening, uh, olive plantation. Uh, and many of these youth, they are, um, they are displaced. They are not in Palestine anymore, uh, but they still are interested to, uh, to understand how this plantation happened because they feel a connection to their homeland just through learning uh, the practices. And I think this uh, is a great example of uh, uh, lose you. No, no, I think I lost connection again. Yeah, you're back again. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, I was saying that, uh, you know, uh, so these youth groups, they are not in their homelands, but this knowledge that is being transferred to them is their only way of feeling connected to their homeland. And I, I was saying that this is a great example of what our publication, the next publication of PATH was based on, the peace indicators, is basically collecting people's perception of peace, how they uh, you know, perceive peace and how they understand peace. Uh, is very important to measure the success of your peace building projects as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we are coming up to the end of our time uh, now. Um, so I'd like to thank in particular Ellie and Mahona. I know that Ellie has to dash off to do bedtime duties <laughs> for the children. So I'll say goodbye. I can hear screaming from here. <laughs> Yes, okay. So thank you so much for giving up your time for us. We'll we'll let you go because I know that uh, you're being hassled. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Ellie. Thank you for having us. Mahona as well. Thank you for having us. Well, it's been um it's been really uh, a great pleasure. You've really brought a great level of professionalism to uh, to this. It's been fantastic. And I have to wrap up now and thank everybody else. This is going to get like the Oscars. Uh, because <laughs> this is our last um, one in this series. Um, and um, But we've had amazing uh, attendance and incredible, um, really good engagement in the chat. Um, and we've had more people than we ever imagined that would join us. Uh, we've actually got um, in total uh, registered for this course, we've got uh, nearly 950 people and we've got them from 101 countries. So we were really totally amazed uh, at that. Obviously a lot of people follow it um, asynchronously uh, as you know, it's the middle of the night and uh, where they are, but we've had an amazing response. And so we will definitely be carrying it on. Um, and uh, next week, I'll um, send you all a message when we firmed up some dates. I'll send you all a message of uh, the future plans that uh, we have. Uh, we are going to maintain the social media uh, pages that we have. So uh, the Facebook and the, um, the LinkedIn pages, we will keep going. If you wish to keep um, putting stuff on them, uploading and chatting with each other, uh, you can do so. That's that's fine. Uh, we will we will keep that going. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, and, uh, the other thing we're going to keep going as well is the name. We're going to keep uh, protecting the future as a kind of name for all of the things that we do, so that uh, so that we don't have to like repeat the work. Um, and um, obviously, really, you know, I can't do all this by myself. Um, and I just have to say a huge thank you to uh, everybody behind the scenes, 
um, particular to our communications uh, guru, uh, Harry, who's been brilliant, and to Melissa, who's been absolutely amazing on the uh, answering in the chat, and uh, to Sarah and to the other people who've helped out. So thank you all very much. But most of all, thank you to, um, to you all for participating, not just turning up, but also participating so actively in the chat and the Q&A. It's just been great. It's been so interesting. And to hear from all people around the world, it's just been fantastic. So um, goodbye for now, but I hope that we're going to see you all again soon. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>